Welcome back. We have movement with the robot arm after the completion of the joint two assembly, including the installation of the J2 motor. We now have joint two and joint one both rotating. Follow along in this episode to see how we got it done. We start the build of the joint two assembly with this high flex industrial Cat 5E patch cord with a thick outer jacket, braided shielding, and four pairs of colored wire. This cable is used extensively in this project to help connect the limit switches and encoder wires back into the joint one base enclosure. We take the wire here and using our ruler, which in my case is only 40 centimeters long, measure a full 70 centimeter length of the Cat 5E patch cord. Using a sharp pair of side cutters, we then cut the Cat 5E cord, which takes quite a bit of pressure to get through the outer jacket and all of the wires. We can now pack this away and move on to the next step. Grabbing our trusty Stanley knife, we extend the smallest amount of blade possible and then run it down one side of the Cat 5 cable to cut the jacket without cutting into the inside shielding or any of the inside wires. Pressing this down against the work surface does make it much easier to follow that line, after which we can then pull the outer jacket off of the inner wires. Lowering the pace down a little bit, we now go through the critical step of carefully removing the inner shielding from the Cat 5A cable. So firstly we wind back the foil that's on the outside before cutting that off with the side cutters. After this we need to remove the braiding that's around the outside. I'm using the special cable cutting tool by Antig which has a variable depth blade which I have carefully calibrated to only cut off the outer shielding. This is quite risky because it could cut through the cables inside but it does make the task a little bit easier and requires only a few other braids to be cut with the side cutters to be able to remove that shielding. In the manual, it suggests pushing this backwards to bunch it up before carefully using side cutters to cut it off. But it's a bit of a tedious process, you need to take your time doing it because uh, you don't want to cut those wires inside. Once this is done, we can then pull the braiding off the inside. This side we're only cutting to a length of 10 centimeters, whereas on the other end of the cable, we're cutting it to a 15 centimeter length. So cutting off the remaining braids, we can then pull the shielding off and we're left with the green inside, which is the plastic. This also gets wound back and then we cut the green plastic off leaving the four pairs of colored wire inside being brown, green, blue, and orange. To stop the wire from fraying, we cut a small section of heat shrink and fit it over each end of the 70 centimeter long cable where the shielding has been removed. So at the 10 centimeter end and the longer 15 centimeter end, putting it over the top of the inner shielding and then shrinking it down so it fully seals off the end of the cables. At the shorter 10 centimeter end, we cut the brown and blue wire pairs to a length of 40 millimeters, so four centimeters. Separating out the wire pairs of the 10 centimeter end, I cut off the solid green wire, which is not needed. All of the ends are stripped back about two to three millimeters and then tinned using a soldering iron and solder. From electrical kit bag one of two, we get the Sevcon limit switch, the larger type of limit switch, which is uh, the same one used for joint one. We can then tin each of the lugs so that it's prepared for when we solder the wires to the limit switch. Grabbing the 10 centimeter long striped green wire, we can solder this to the com lug of the limit switch, which is the lug furthest from the limit switch arm. We then reorient the limit switch, make it easier to solder the solid orange wire to the center lug, which is the normally open lug, being careful not to put too much heat into it. Finally, we turn it over to the side where the lever is, and solder the striped and solder the striped orange wire. Now I'm doing a simple continuity check using a multimeter and putting one lead into the COM terminal and the other onto the normally closed terminal. When the switch is pressed, it shows OL on the screen. Otherwise there are values shown because the circuit is actually closed. I repeat the same process on the normally open, which when you press the switch shows values on the screen. Now that we're happy that all of the joints are properly soldered, we can apply our liquid electrical tape, covering up all of the lugs and making sure that we get plenty liquid electrical tape in from both sides. Uh, using gravity to assist us, putting it between the center lugs. I also use the nozzle to push the liquid electrical tape around, making sure that it's evenly spread and covering all metal conductive surfaces. Bringing the main robotic arm assembly to date back onto the workstation, we can install the limit switch 
which is situated just underneath the rotating J2 turret. Using two M3 by 14 millimeter Phillip head screws, we screw the limit switch into the J2 turret assembly and then make sure that the switch is being activated when the R goes down to the rest point. Clearing our workspace, we replace the robot arm assembly with the J2 motor, J2 motor mount, the 3D printed YGS spacer, and the packet of M4 by 45mm threaded bolts that come in the AR4 hardware kit. We then use our M3 Allen key to remove these four M4 bolts from the top of the J2 motor's gearbox. These are very tightly installed using a lot of Loctite, and as you can see, I had to use the pliers to extend the torque arm and crack the Loctite that was present with the bolts. With all four bolts successfully removed, we set them to the side and remove the top of the gearbox. It's important to take all planetary gears off and make sure that they're correctly aligned on their pins. So we can see inside there and we can now slip this YGS spacer on, making sure that the recessed 3D printed side faces towards the motor end and the flat side faces towards the J2 motor mount. We can then fit the J2 motor mount over the top making sure that we have it correctly aligned with the wires before putting the planetary gearbox over the top again. This is quite difficult to get aligned, so a little bit of wiggling it back and forth to get the gear splines to line up or uh, finally get it to seat in place. After this, we can fit all four of the bolts uh, back into the top of the motor, sealing it off once more. Make sure to do up all four of these bolts tightly again, torquing them back up so that they're really firmly pulling the gearbox into the motor output shaft. Turning our attention to the other end of the J2 motor, use a three millimeter Allen key to crack these bolts that secure the J2 motor to the gearbox from the other side. These then get replaced with the M3 by 45 Phillip head screws, which are screwed all the way through not only the motor, but the YGS spacer and then the J2 motor mount. There's only a very small amount that's protruding from the end and we can fit a washer and a small nut from the hardware kit onto that. So we repeat this process with all four. During this process, I actually stripped a Allen key due to the amount of Loctite that's uh, present in all of these and had to get a much stronger chromium molybdenum Allen key. So be mindful of that. Otherwise, the process was pretty straightforward, screwing the M3 bolts into the motor and the motor mount. With all of the 45 millimeter long screws installed, we can now uh, fit the flat washer and a small nut over each one, just tightening it up uh, gently, not all of the way until we've installed the full motor assembly. Bring the robotic arm assembly back onto the workbench. I then use a small adjustable spanner to rotate the motor shaft until it aligns with the keyway of the joint two tension ring when the main arm is sitting on the J2 end stop. After checking the alignment, I then try and fit the key into the keyway. This was incredibly difficult and required me to use a vise to press the key into the, key, into the keyway of the J2 motor shaft. After this, to help me get it into the main joint two assembly already on the arm, I put the entire joint two motor assembly into the freezer, bringing it down to negative 18 degrees Celsius before I brought it across to the workbench and then uh, kind of wheeled it into place while pressing it into the main joint two bearing assembly. After ensuring that the J2 motor assembly is correctly fitted into the keyway and correctly aligned with the J1 platform, we can insert the three M6 by 18 bolts, which in future we'll add Loctite to. We don't need to right now as it's easily accessible. Now that we have the J2 motor assembly securely attached to the J1 platform and it's all lined up, we can tighten the four nuts that are part of the joint two motor assembly, which were attached onto the end of the M4 by 45 millimeter bolt bolts passing from the motor through to the joint two motor mount. To tighten these up, I did have to take the washers off in order to be able to have enough grip on the thread. And you'll also note 
just how cold the whole assembly is from the freezer with the condensation forming on the outside. The process of mechanically coupling the joint to motor assembly to the rest of the robotic arm is completed with the installation of this M6 by 20 cap screw which pulls the joint to motor mount together and also the tightening of the set screw which we previously installed when we built the J2 arm by aligning the robotic arm vertically and then using a small two millimeter allen key to tighten uh, the set screw. Transitioning back from the mechanical aspect to the electrical side, we separate out the joint two motor wires and encoder wires into two separate bundles. Using some heat shrink over the end of the joint two motor wires, we can bundle all of those together. We repeat this process with the encoder wires. After this is done, we can then take some quarter inch braided sleeve, which we cut to a length of 15 and a half centimeters before feeding the wires through that braided sleeve, which leaves us with nicely routed wires that can go to the joint one platform and subsequently to the J1 base enclosure. With the braided sleeve pressed up against the joint two motor, we can apply some liquid electrical tape to both bond the braided sleeve to the motor and seal the connection. After waiting for the liquid electrical tape to set, we can set aside the thicker motor wires from the joint two motor and then separate out the encoder wires, making sure that we hold on to the red, black, brown and blue wires while cutting the otherwise shorter inside of the braided sleeve. It's then possible to feed these through the small hole that remains in the side of the joint to motor support, which then brings them into the center of the arm assembly. With all the wires now routed into the center of the robotic arm assembly, we separate out the joint to motor wires, setting them to the side, and then ensure that the encoder wires are long enough to reach the end of the Cat5e cable. I then use one of the alligator clips from the third arm assembly to hold the Cat5e cables out out of the way as seen here and then use a Stanley knife to gently cut the insulation off the end of each of the encoder wires coming from the joint two motor. The reason I use the Stanley knife is simply that now that the wires are inside of this enclosure it's incredibly difficult to get wire strippers into this central location uh, and onto the end of the wires. The Stanley knife does a great job of stripping the ends of the wires. If you're patient and don't apply too much pressure the small sawing action and then rotate the wire between your fingers so that you're slowly cutting the insulation from different angles and then pull the ends of the wires off with my fingers. You then repeat this process with all four wires. In preparation of soldering the joint two encoder wires to the Cat5e wires, I cut four lengths of heat shrink and fit them over the ends of the encoder wires, as well as using the soldering iron to tin the end of each of the Cat5e wires. With the heat shrink in place and the ends of the Cat5e wires tinned, we can now join the encoder wires from the joint two motor to the Cat5e cable. We solder the red encoder wire to the solid brown Cat5e wire and the black motor encoder wire to the striped brown wire, the brown motor encoder wire to the striped blue wire, and the blue motor encoder wire goes to the solid blue wire in the Cat5e cable. Using the alligator clip from the third arm assembly to hold the Cat5e cables in place, and then pliers to hold the encoder wires from the joint two motor in place, we can easily solder these wires together. Assembly out of the way, we can slide the heat shrink that we put onto the wires before further along so it's covering up the solder joint. We then, uh, although it's obscured by my hand, I then pull the wires away from the enclosure, allowing me to get the lighter in and the flame underneath the heat shrink so I can seal up the joint. I repeat this process with all sets of wires and then feed a large piece of blue heat shrink all along the Cat5 cable and then over all of the solder joints. Due to the tight space and the wires being taut, we can't use a lighter in this area, so we use the tip of the soldering iron to close up the large heat shrink, neatly routing the wires. With the joint two motor encoder wires now wired to the Cat5e cable, all that's left is to extend the joint two motor wires themselves so that they can make it into the joint one enclosure and to the stepper motor driver. To do this, we remove these four bundles of 20 American wire gauge wire from the AR4 electrical kit bag one, uh, which are red, black, green, and blue, with the blue looking a bit more like purple than blue. On our workbench, which is now getting a bit cluttered, we can cut some 34 centimeter lengths of the wire and then pack the wire bundles away just to clear off a little bit of space. Once this is done, we then strip the ends of the wires using a wire stripper, which is now effective this time as we have more space to work with. 
and thicker wires. With the ends of the wires stripped, we can put the motor wires into one side of the third arm soldering station and pin both ends of the wires. We then solder the wires together, soldering the black, then green, then red, and then blue wires together. Finally, to finish wiring the J2 motor, we add some heat shrink over the top of each of the wires, trying to color code it as much as possible. So black over the black, red over the red, green over the green. Unfortunately, I didn't have any blue heat shrink, so it's black over the blue. And then we use a lighter to seal the heat shrink. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in episode nine for the installation of the joint three assembly.